Space Quest IV, Roger Wilco and the Time Rippers, is a point-and-click adventure sci-fi comedy from 1991, and today you'll learn how speedrunners beat the game in under 10 minutes. We're going to be watching an any percent run by Admiral J, the current world record holder. The first minute of the run goes by fast, so let's explain a few things ahead of time. First, runners use the floppy disk version because it has a major skip that's not possible on the CD version, and because the CD version has a number of issues, which we'll talk about shortly. Second, the game is being run in a special version of ScumVM that is closer to a native DOS environment. This has the effect of running faster, or maybe it's more accurate to say that it doesn't slow the game down, like the official ScumVM. This version also eliminates some inconsistencies that can happen across different machines, creating an even playing field for runners. Third, uh, the story. Yeah, this game has one of those. So our character, Roger Wilco, is bragging about his past adventures at a bar when he's abducted by the sequel police. They have orders to kill Roger from the series villain, Sludge Volhall. Some mysterious men intervene, and one of them opens up a time rift. The rift sends Roger into the future, all the way to Space Quest 12. In this future, a supercomputer has taken over Roger's home planet and done a bit of apocalyptic redecorating. Uh, and that's where the game begins. Time for the speedrun starts after resetting when the player first gets control of the cursor. Admiral J is going to start by increasing the game speed before heading to the sewer. Throughout the run, he prepares the cursor ahead of time using visual cues to quickly get inputs off. J picks up a jar, which he'll use to gather some slime. He uses the tab key to open inventory without going to the menu, and he's memorized the jar's position. After getting the slime, he climbs back up to the surface where the sequel police are landing. There are some other things we could have picked up, namely a Pocket Pal computer and a battery, but you don't actually need those. More on that later. As soon as the sequel police exit their craft, Jay is going to run over to it and hitch a ride. In the floppy version that we're playing, the game waits for the music to end before putting down the craft's landing gear. That makes this cutscene longer than the CD version by about 20 seconds. But the big skip I mentioned earlier, as well as some other differences, make up for the longer wait. For instance, if you use this version of ScumVM with the CD version of the game, then the event timers are ridiculously fast and you just die. So the only way to run the CD version is in a much slower environment where all the animations take longer to complete. In a second, we'll be free to roam about and Admiral J will hijack a time pod, a craft that can travel through time. There's a copy protection screen that he dispatches with quickly, but let's take a second to look at this dumb copy protection. The game gives you two mathematical symbols. You're supposed to consult a table in the manual and then put in the corresponding letters. Funny thing though, only five of these symbols are actually possible to get. Even weirder, the game is biased in its selection, and you'll get some symbols more often than others. Jay takes a moment to memorize the randomized timecode because he'll need it to come back to the sequel later. The game then requires you to put in two timecodes. It doesn't matter what these are, because as a joke, the first one fails. But the second one works, and the only requirement is that the second one is different from the first. Now that we're in Space Quest 10, Jay walks one screen to the left, which is the trigger for a pterodactyl to appear in just a second and take us to its nest. Jay quickly jumps off, ignoring this dead sequel policeman who I'm sure isn't important at all. 
These are the latex babes of Estros, and one of them is pretty ticked off because a future version of Roger led her on and then ghosted her. What happens next is kind of hard to explain, or maybe not hard, I just don't want to explain it. They're going to get back at Roger by shaving his legs. And then a uh, giant sea slug shows up and we make it go away. And then the women want to celebrate by going shopping. Oh, and in a blink and you miss it cutscene, the dude who saved us at the beginning turns out to be our son and he's been captured by Volhall. Anyway, I wasn't kidding about the mall. Jay picks up an ATM card that one of the babes dropped and tries to use it at an ATM. Except it doesn't work because the ATM has a visual scanner and we don't look anything like the card's owner. So, okay, follow along here. Withdrawing all the cash from her account is one of the game progression triggers, so we need to look like a blonde woman, which means buying a dress and a wig. But we can't afford that, so we need to get a job at Monolith Burger. But the burger place has a very strict no shirt, no shoes, no service policy, so first we head to the big and tall shop and buy some pants and shoes. As an aside, in the CD version, buying pants is the only one of these steps that's strictly required. All right, back over to Monolith Burger. There's a burger making mini game you can play, but in a rare moment of Sierra lenience, you can skip it. The owner pays us, fires us, tosses us out, and throws his cigar on the beltway. Remember that for later. Now that we have the money, we can head to Saks, the women's clothing store, and pay for the dress and wig. The outfit fools the ATM, and we drain the account. This gives us a lot of money, which we'll never end up spending. The game thinks you need the money though, and as I mentioned, it's a requirement to move the story forward. The game also isn't going to let Roger walk around the rest of the game looking like this, so we need to change back into our regular clothes. All right, now that we're back to normal, it's time for what is universally considered the most annoying part of the game. Skaterama. And to explain why it's so frustrating, I'm going to hand it over to an expert, the Space Quest historian. Hi, I'm the Space Quest historian. So, the Skaterama, huh? What a piece of sh**. The point of it is to get Roger from one side of the skating rink to the other so he can go into the arcade and steal the time pod that the secret police left behind. Now, the way you're supposed to do the Skaterama sequence is you're supposed to repeatedly click to make Roger sort of swim faster in the air. And it's also a matter of clicking the actual precise pixel perfect spot to get into the uh, upper dome. And once you're in the upper dome, you're supposed to fly up just a tad because there's a invisible trigger line that forces the sequel policeman to materialize from the other side. And that's when you're supposed to go down on the other side and run across. And that was all well and good at least in the disc version of the game. It was brutal, but it was still fair. You could evade the sequel police and you could get into the time pod if you just practiced long and hard enough. But when the game was released on CD-ROM, Sierra upgraded the internal game engine known as SCI and for some reason went in and reprogrammed how the timer works. See, in the disc version, it just does what you'd expect. It counts ticks or seconds or milliseconds or whatever. I mean, the point is the timer is the same regardless of the speed of your computer. Not so in the CD-ROM version. In the CD-ROM version, the timer is dependent on the speed of your computer. And that means that the Skaterama sequence, as well as other sequences in the game, become frustratingly impossible. The faster your computer is, the faster the timer runs out. So the sequel policemen arrive much earlier than they're supposed to. And not just in the Skaterama, but even at the start of the game where you're supposed to get into the patrol ship. Sometimes you can't even do that because there's a sequel policeman right there at the patrol ship guarding it and you can't get anywhere. 
Now, in the old days, we had to use TSR utilities like Moslo and Turbo to slow our computers down to the point where the game became beatable. And with the advent of DOSBox, now we can control the CPU cycles and, you know, force the game to run at a much slower clock speed. And of course, if you run the game in Scum VM, they have fixed these timer issues. There was even a fan patch made back in ye olden days called the New Rising Sun patch. And that was the only way you could physically beat the CD-ROM version of Space Quest 4 if you had anything faster than a fast 386 or a slow 486, you were shit out of luck. And I had a cool 486DX266 megahertz with eight megabytes of RAM and a double speed CD-ROM drive and Space Quest 4 was just a flat out no-go. And that's the reason why the Skaterama is so awful. Thank you. Thanks, SQH. So, what's supposed to happen is that we go into the arcade, the sequel police show up, and then all that nonsense happens. In the CD version, if you go directly back into the arcade, one of the policemen zaps you straight off. But in the floppy disk version, if you go back, there's about a quarter of a second where you still have control of Roger. You can, during that quarter of a second, use the hand icon to interact with an arcade machine. Instead of being killed, Roger walks over to the Ms. Astro chicken machine and plays. After you game over, the bad guy with the bad gun is gone, and we can hijack the time pod having skipped Skaterama. The skip does introduce some RNG because there are slow and quick ways to die in the arcade game. In this run, Jay gets the slow deaths. The world record, on the other hand, has the quick deaths. Okay, so now that we can leave, we put in the time code for Space Quest 12, the one Jay memorized at the beginning. If you've played the game, you know that what we're supposed to do is put in a different time code and travel to Space Quest 1. But we don't know that code because half of it was in this guy's pocket and the other half is in the Space Quest 4 hint book we didn't buy. Yes, the game contains its own hint book. Fortunately, we don't need to go to Space Quest 1 and you'll learn why in a second. Back in the hangar, Jay uses the jar of slime from the sewer to melt a lock. If you're wondering why we didn't do this earlier, it's because the door is guarded at the beginning of the game. Inside this hallway, there's a series of deadly invisible lasers. Now, the only reason to go to Space Quest 1 is to pick up a book of matches. When you combine that with the cigar, which we also didn't pick up, there's enough smoke to see the lasers, and we can use this panel to align them safely. On the other hand, we could just put in the right numbers to begin with. In the CD version, this isn't possible because of another one of those timing bugs. The faster your computer is, the less the beams rotate relative to the number entered. So here I am putting in the same number every time, and sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. You also might have noticed that Jay saves some time by not using the mouse to input the numbers. Instead, he uses the numpad, a possibility that not all players may know about. Now, where are we? This is the evil supercomputer that's taken over the planet, and these twisty walkways lead to where Sludge Volhall is holding our son captive. Unfortunately, there are two patrolling droids, and they don't particularly like us. Walkthroughs will tell you the solution is... Deep breath. Look at one of the control boxes to see the shape of the receptacle, which is randomized. Take the time pod back to the Galleria, go to the electronics store, buy the matching connector, come all the way back, and then plug in the Pocket Pal computer from the very beginning of the game. From this, you can monitor the locations of the droids and avoid them. Or, you could walk over to this screen, wait a second down here, and then walk back up. Jay's now making his way to the programming chamber. There's a lock on the door, and you're supposed to know the code from reading the Space Quest 4 hint book, but the number's the same every time. Now, there's something else fascinating about the code. After Jay recorded this run, I was chatting with Sluicebox, one of the Scum VM developers. Sluicebox then discovered that instead of this, you can just put in 26229. Why? 
Well, the game takes the player's input and tries to store it as a number, specifically a 16-bit unsigned integer. When a number is too big to fit inside this range, the result wraps around the maximum. This is called an integer overflow. You can also think of it as dividing by the number of possible values and taking the remainder. This is exactly what happens with our passcode. So, the game takes what you put in the keypad, tries to turn it into an integer, and opens the door if that value equals 26,229. Therefore... And now, back to the run. At the terminal, Admiral J flushes the droids, which deactivates them, and then flushes the computer's brain, which starts a time-to-format countdown. If the timer gets to zero before we escape with our son, it's game over. Unfortunately, Sludge Volhall has downloaded his consciousness into our son's body and put our son's mind on a disc. So, Roger needs to wrestle with his son Volhall, Sludge son, and get him caught in an upload-download beam. If you watch Let's Plays, you'll see people wait until Volhall starts walking towards Roger before doing anything, but waiting actually isn't necessary, and you just have to click five times. Admiral J runs down to grab the disc, and then puts it into the disc drive unit. He removes Volhall, puts his son's mind back in his body, and that's the end of the game, as well as the run. The end credits sequence kind of explains things, but it also doesn't explain much at all, so I'm going to thank my patrons for their amazing support. I'd also like to thank Admiral J and the other runners who answered my questions, as well as the Space Quest historian for his help. Thank you for watching, and as usual, you've been a real pantload.